Hello? <laughs> All right, so um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, not setting fire to your router today um, or breaking to embedded devices. So um, I'm Darren Martin, um, go by Infodox on the Twitters, um, pen test for research, and forensic student over at GMIT back in Ireland where I spend half my time. Um, yeah, or as Graham Cluley says, um, immoral, unethical twit. <laughs> um, we may have had disagreements about things in the past. So um, today, I'm going to give a gentle introduction to the wonderful world of um, breaking to embedded devices. So like stuff that you probably have in your living room. So we all have like, everyone who's got an internet connection probably has a router or a switch. You've probably got a, like one of them Plex boxes, some kind of NAS or, you know, some little black box which does internet and which does some kind of thing which you find useful, be it like one of them stupid Amazon boxes that you talk to and it tells you things, or you know, a little box that gives you Netflix, or the little magical box which all your internet traffic goes through. So we're gonna look at the hardware and software side of it. Um, firstly hardware and then later on software, because they kind of go hand in hand. Um, it's a gentler introduction designed for, you know, if you've never played an embedded device before, this will give you some ideas so you can go and take your fucking router apart that came from Virgin Media, which is full of remote root phones, so you can have a lot of fun. And also we're gonna look at people actually breaking these things in the wild and what people are doing for post-exploitation and how we can have a lot of fun with that. So yeah. So um, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna talk about like, so you've got embedded devices, right? and they all have got firmware on them and stuff. And firmware is like the software it runs on the hardware to do the magic stuff which the box does. And we're gonna talk about where the hell do we get the firmware. We're gonna talk about how to interface with one of the various interfaces you can use to play with these things, which is UART, which is a hardware interface like over serial to USB type thing. You know, it's a serial interface we can use to get a debug interface in the devices. We're going to have a look at how to extract the firmware. We're going to do it. I've got a case study in finding a shitload of vulnerabilities. Um, we're going to talk about exploit development a bit. I'm going to whinge a bit about Rapid7 and Metasploit, amongst other things. And well, that can fuck right off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to have a look at uh, malware in the wild, which pops these things. Um, and then we're gonna look at post-exploitation, and then we're gonna look at some future ideas of daftness um, and how we can have a lot of fun. And hopefully there's no more walls of text after this, but I can't promise that because I put all my slides in slash temp, and then I reboot up my box, so I had to rewrite the bloody things, so some screenshots are missing here and there. So there is a couple of more walls of text, but none that bad. So yeah, firmware. I swear to God, this is exactly what firmware looks like. You have a bunch of microchips, and then you have a bunch of ones and zeros, or something like that. Um, I found the most ridiculous image I could get. But firmware is software which basically runs on hardware. So it's the software which drives it all. So you've got like your operating system and a lot above it. And then you've got firmware, which is microchip level stuff. So if you're not familiar with firmware, um, it's so you've got a piece of hardware and then you've got stuff on it which does stuff like software and that's your firmware. It's, it's hard to actually conceptualize and explain if you don't know what it is. Um, you can probably, you know, get the general idea, software which runs on hardware, so that's firmware. Um, right, so where do we get the firmware for, you know, all these magical embedded devices we're gonna be breaking, you know, they all have firmware which runs on the hardware and we have to go get it. So um, we can either download it from the internet, because some vendors are great. They run open download sites where you can just pull it down and have a crack at it. Or you can ask people on the internet, because some people you know, will be friendly enough to provide it to you. So random internet people. Or you can rip it straight off the device. Or there's other methods which I won't talk about for legal reasons. So here we have D-Link's FTP server, which has been submitted to the archive team. Um, it's magical, right? So you've got this D-Link run, this open FTP server with firmware for every single one of their devices, pretty much. And if you run wget dash dash mirror, they get really upset. Um, you can get firmware for all their devices, you can get all the user manuals, a whole lot off there. So I'd strongly advise having a look, because if you're looking for router zero days sometime later next week, probably, go there. 
you've got everything you need. Um, we also have Netgear's stupid support center, which unfortunately isn't as easy to mirror as an open FTP. You have to click through a bunch of bullshit to get to it, but um, you've got user guides, you've got firmwares, you've got the whole lot. You just search by product and version, and you can pull it down from there. So that's really easy to get at. Now, some other vendors aren't as nice, so I throw it into the Google machine because you'll get results. Somebody somewhere will probably dump the thing out to somewhere. And then, this is kind of where we go and do stuff. So we've got extracting a device. So you've got the black box, and nobody's been friendly enough to provide it. The vendor's not providing it because the vendor's being a vendor. So you need to go get the damn thing off the device. And we're going to talk a bit about UART here. Now, basically, you get some kind of shell on the device. I'll explain a bit more into it in a bit. But, and then you get the stuff you care about, which is normally the root file system off the device. That's because most of them run Linux. We're going to ignore the stuff which doesn't run Linux, because quite frankly, I couldn't be bothered writing payloads for that. Um, probably none of the rest of you want to do it either, because it's a massive pain. Um, and then you have a look at it. So um, two main ways we can play with this. And so UART is universal asynchronous receiver slash transmitter, which, funnily enough, I didn't actually know what that meant until yesterday because it was just them four pins on a device that I played with. Um, basically a serial port, though. So you just have a serial port. And that's, quite frankly, all I care about. I don't care about the specification of it, because it's irrelevant. Um, it's, only, it's got four pins. Sometimes you see five on the pinout. Um, we only care about three of them. The rest can go, you know. We've got receive, transmit, VCC, which we don't care about, and we've got ground. So we can just ignore VCC, because VCC has caused me massive pains before with burning out chips that, like, burning out my serial converter. Um, when you smell melting silicon, you've done something wrong. And you need to re-question your life choices. So that's what UART pins look like on one device I was taking part the other day. So you've got four pins there. It's actually a five pin out header. Um, so you've got just one, two, three, four. The one that's missing, I actually don't know what the hell it does. Um, never bothered finding out, to be quite honest. Um, that. When you take apart your router and you find something like that, it's game on. And sometimes <clears throat> you get vendors like TP-Link who are really fucking annoying because they remove the pins. They leave you with um, four little pads on the board, which like where the pins were. And you can see the soldered, you know, the holes. And they've basically removed the pins and soldered over the holes. So you end up looking at it and you go, right, we've four pins in sequence here. And you just desolder them, which for me was getting a soldering iron and just stabbing it repeatedly until the holes were open again. <laughs> um, because I was a bit hungover and I was really pissed off. Because I thought there'd be four pins. Um, and then you just stick in four jumper cables, solder them in place, and boom, you've got a serial pin out. Um, that router, by the way, has really ticked me off. That particular one's a TP-Link box because um, I mixed up VCC and ground. Now, ground has nothing going through it normally. Ground is just ground. And me being an idiot, I crossed over the VCC and ground pins, and VCC is 3.3 going through it. And my little serial to USB adapter didn't really expect 3.3 going through ground and proceeded to melt. <laughs> Don't do that. Check with the multimeter before you connect anything, because otherwise you're going to have a really bad day. So um, to talk to UR pin, to talk to UR pinouts, um, you could buy a bus pirate 15 quid. It'll interface with anything you want. It's really slow. And it's a massive pain to get used to, because the documentation is absolutely rubbish. And it'll interface with anything, though, and you just have to figure out which ones are which. Or you get a two quid USB TTL converter off eBay, um, because if you set fire to those, it doesn't cost as much and you don't kick yourself as much later on. Um, they're less pretty, but they do the job for what we're doing today. Um, they're two quid. I'd advise buying ones when you're really drunk, because that way, when you fuck it up the next day, you can just go, oh, fuck it, I've bought a spare. You know, it'll arrive in two days, which is one of them habits that you might get into. Um, so yeah, this is the red one is fried. The blue one's OK. The red one died to the TP-Link. 
I've got a bunch more dead ones um, that don't work anymore. Because again, mix up ground and VCC and you're basically screwed. So don't do that. Um, these are really useful because it turns out that you can unlock Samsung phones with them. So, but you've got four pins. Which one goes where? Now, somebody else explains it way better than I do, so I'm not really going to get into that because they've written this lengthy, exhaustive blog post on it, which explains it in far more detail than I ever could because I'm not so great at words and stuff But when it comes to this kind of thing. But get a multimeter or preferably an oscilloscope. Now, I'm using a multimeter because the oscilloscope I soldered myself together last week from parts kit from China because I didn't want to spend a load of money buying one. And I don't know if it actually works. So I was using a multimeter. Thing is, get a good multimeter. Don't get like a five quid Maplin's one, because otherwise you're shafting yourself in the long run. Spend the money, get a decent one. Um, I've been using a really shit Maplin one, and it doesn't actually have a proper continuity checker. So it's been a massive pain to work with. And I've been going, I should get a good multimeter. I'll do that tomorrow. And I never have. So just get a good one to start out with. Um, so yeah, the ground pin. If you get, now a good place to look is the Ethernet socket in your device. If you tap one of the things, if you hold onto the Ethernet socket, which is the nice grounded shielding thing, and then if you probe the ground pin, you'll get a continuity test of true. So basically ground to ground. Um, shielding on various things, you know them stupid kind of metal cages they put over stuff? Um, that's also good to test on. Um, VCC is just gonna be when you boot up the device, it's going to be tight high 3.3 or 5, depending on who the hell implemented it. Um, you'll just go, yep, you're 3 volts. You've got 3 volts, 3.3 or 5 coming out of you, and it's continuous. It doesn't fluctuate. It just stays high. Um, transmit goes constantly kind of high, low, high, low. And you can tell that really easily with an oscilloscope, or if you sit there with a multimeter and kind of, again, question your life choice for a while, um, you'll see that it kind of fluctuates. You've got like. It goes up to 3.3 and then down, it goes up and down because it's transmitting. And that's it sending basically bits. And as for identifying the receive pin, I don't have a clue. Nobody does because they all bloody behave differently. Um, some of them will go high, some of them will go low, some of them will do weird shit, some of them will fluctuate. Some will behave exactly like VCC or TX pins because they're weird. But if you want to identify the RX pin, it's the one left over. Um, so. We've found the pins. Now we need to interact with it. Now, the only thing we need to do next is find out what baud rate this serial device is speaking on. So you could do this by hand. I mean, you could brute force through all the potential baud rates, or you just run this wonderful script from a guy who knows way more than I've ever forgotten about serial and stuff. And that automatically goes through all the baud rates, and it finds the one that's probably the right one. Might be the wrong one, usually the right one. and. Then instead of using Minicom, now a lot of people say to use Minicom, but Minicom is a massive pain because it just drops sessions and generally acts like a massive arse. So instead you use the built-in screen thing, which if you're on Linux, you'd be familiar with screen. It's where my IRC sessions live. And just do screen, dev TTY USB 0, and then the baud rate, or whatever your serial interface is. In my case, always going to be dev TTY USB 0. And then you've got whatever the hell the router wants to talk to you over serial about, you've got an interface with it. And here we have, it's a router manufactured by Billion that a coworker made the mistake of leaving on my desk. It's no longer in one piece. Um, that's it hooked up to my machine, along with a stack of other bits that I'm taking apart in the background. But um, that one all does gives you a bootloader debug output if you connect it over UART. And that was a lot of fun, because sometimes when you connect up, you just get a straight, you just get this wonderful little hash prompt, and you go, oh, I've got root already. And then you can have a lot of fun. Sometimes you get this really funky U-boot shell. And sometimes, in that case, you just get this debug output of rubbish about what the kernel is doing at that time. Um, yeah, that guy's router is never going to work again, by the way. <laughs> if you have a U-boot shell, now they all behave a little bit differently to each other. Um, you can often just, there's some debug commands in there that you can run, and it'll dump out what's effectively a firmware image, but it's not quite. And then you can just transfer over TFTP. So you hook up over your, UART to ser your USB to serial thing, and you hook it up over Ethernet. And you'll often be able to just transfer the entire root file system back to yourself over TFTP. 
Or if the box just gives you a root shell, well, you've got a root shell, so you just copy all the files over. Boom, done. So you just TFTP it across. So you start an FTP server on slash and you just pull the entire thing down. And then you've got the files, you've got the file structure, you've got all the stuff you need to have a lot of fun. Um, so I'm going to go through um, this bit. Basically, I'm going to go through a case study that um, was I present the end result of the research on at B-Sides Hanover earlier this year. Um, basically, we end up, I end up extracting firmware at scale. I managed to get firmware across all the devices for a certain thing. Um, and it's a really good example of how shit embedded devices are. This is an example of really bad patch management by a vendor. Um, so yeah, we've, we end up, we start off with one move box firm where we get the whole lot from their FTP server and we end up with a shitload of root shells. So, um, because I had about 108 of them and I didn't want to sit there running bin walk all day because I get RSI, um, I just wrote a shell script that wrapped around bin walk and ran it. So there you've got bin walk repeatedly outputting um, what it finds, which is a CRAMFS file system. Now, if you run bin walk with um, the extract argument, it'll automatically extract whatever the root file system is and stick it over there so then you can deal with it later. Um, strongly advise, if you end up downloading all of D-Link's FTP server, which I strongly advise you do if you want to have some fun, just run that over it and you'll end up with lots of fun for weeks and probably questioning your own sanity for a while. But yeah, so bin walk just goes, all right, we've got a file system. Let's take the file system out and put it over here so we can play with it later on. And it's really handy. It can do a lot more useful things than that, but that's the simple and easy way to use it. Um, so yeah, next up, when we've got an absolute shitload of stuff, we um, script on CRAMFS, because these are all CRAMFS. Now, Binwalk will tell you what kind of file system you're dealing with. So here's the most horrible piece of Python code in the world. Um, it does stuff. It just calls the firmware modkit version of on CRAMFS, and it just dumps out all the CRAMFS file systems into a file called lol. Um, it's disgusting. I do not advise running this in production because it's horrible. Um, you should probably not call system ever, but it does the thing. And it dumped out root FSs, and I was able to sit there and go through files and stuff and do diffing. And if you get a whole bunch of different versions of something, you diff across, and you diff the differences across each version, you're going to find loads of bugs that have been patched. So you find all your one day, you find your 10 years ago day. Um, you find all the fun stuff. So when you're finding vulnerabilities in these things, um, I take a fairly blind approach. Some people, like the guy from the guys at Tactical Network Solutions, they break out IDA and they go, right, let's have a crack at this. And it's way easier if you just kind of go, right, where's the low-hanging fruit? Because low-hanging fruit is awesome. And you just kind of grep for stuff. You can just have a look. You can open up in your debugger and your disassembler later, but it's when you start off, if you just kind of grep for things, you just kind of have a look. And most of the time, you find a remote route within about 10 minutes, because these things are really, really awful. Um, there's no security. Um, so you have a look at the web interface, because that's what's exposed. You, know? you have a crack at that first. Now, why does this look interesting? Have we uh, stupidly named bug this year, which um, we can see that bin sh links to bash and the index.cgi calls bash. And then in the config, we've got stuff like specify that the user is root and that there's no ch root. This is normal. You'll find this. You've got all these wonderful options and all the software that runs in these things, which could be secure. Like, you could run it as user nobody and in a ch root. But they're like, Haha, no. We don't want to do a CH root. We want to run as root all the time and execute commands and stuff. So you end up with stuff like that, which ends up with something like this, where you write a really awful piece of Python, because I'm really shit at bash, and I'm all right at Python, to test every single version of that firmware for Shellshock. And I was kind of thinking, this isn't going to be bloody vulnerable to Shellshock. You know, no way. Surely they've sorted their shit out by now. But this is vendors who kind of ignore patching. And you know, they're going to ship vulnerable shit for years. So that's the script. That's what happened when I ran it. <laughs> We've got, yeah. 
So we've got all of them vulnerable, all of them running that CGI script, and all of them running their web server as root, which, you know, everyone's kind of figured out by now is a really bad idea. So um, the results of that, it was 108 firmware images. Um, the results were all 108 vulnerable shell shock, all 108 the really horrible CGI scripts, 106 had THPD, and this is why I'm not allowed to type late at night. Routing, that should be, but, um, or running. Um, yeah, they had THTP running as root, and two ran light HTTP, but they also specified to run it as root because, hey, we've got a thing here which should do privsec, and we've told it to not do that. So some engineer somewhere has deliberately fucked with the default config the software is using to make it run insecurely. He sat there and he's gone, my stuff won't work unless I really break the security model of this shit. Let's ship it anyway. Because that's what you get in embedded land. And this was the end result. Bling, bling. You get remote root everywhere. So next time you're sitting on a bus and you're a bit bored, or if the Wi-Fi is acting up, it's probably running a move box. You get root in half a second. I'm not condoning that activity, by the way. I'm just saying. <laughs> so um, we've got root. You know, let's let's look for more fun stuff. Um, so I looked at the password files across all the different firmware versions because I wanted to see if they did anything different across each one, and I found four unique hashes across the lot. And there they are. Somebody please crack them. It's been doing my nut. A few people, one or two of them who are here, or who'll be here later today, have thrown GPUs at these. And I strongly expect they're randomly generated because nothing has cracked even a single one of these. So if you've got a nice cluster, bang these in, have a crack at them, because I've failed. Friends of mine have failed to crack them. Thrown best 64, massive word lists, let it run for a month, nothing. So if you can crack those hashes, tell me. <laughs> This is another one. Um, this is gonna, you're going to find this if you ever look at embedded devices a lot. Embedded device, because they boot up with no entropy, because their real-time operating system is what runs them, basically. You're going to find the vendors hard code like the SSH host and DSA keys. And in the case of Movebox, they also had like, some random private key with no password dumped somewhere, which was in each C slash SSH key. So when you have a look at these, you're kind of like, well, the device starts at no entropy, so it can't just regenerate the keys every time it boots. So you end up with hard-coded vendor-specified root keys left there, which are never changed on reboot. They, they could be, but it's a case of not enough entropy to regen them, because it starts off with the same zero entropy pools, so you just create predictable keys anyway. So they hard-code them, and they're rubbish. But um, you can use these to fingerprint. So. The HCS Sage key, when I scanned using Shodan to have a look to see what box out there lived with that host key, I found two random boxes in Germany, which you could hypothetically log in with that SSH key, but I don't advise doing that. Um, I published the SSH key, by the way. It's up on GitHub. Um, I don't know who these boxes belong to. They're random boxes that there's a SSH private key for, for some random user, go figure it out. Um, that lives on every single move engine box. Um, have fun. So yeah, you can just bang stuff into Shodan and you get results that are bloody hilarious. And then, as for the other SSH keys, the ones which are hard-coded on device, if you get the fingerprint of those and you stick them into Shodan, you'll often find that every other device made by the same vendor has the same key, or every other, sp that specific device you'll find every instance of it in the internet if you scan for SSH using it or something. So we had, what was the number? We had about, yeah, a thousand or so, you know, boxes on Shodan that, you know, were this same box with the same SSH key um, that you could get into via various remote root things, one of which I showed in a few slides ago. Um, so yeah, all those were vulnerable, but you can use these to fingerprint and you can use these to identify. So if, you're, if you find a vulnerable one thing, you just take the SSH key of that box, scan for it, and you'll find all the other ones. Um, really handy way, you know, if you're writing a vulnerability scanner or something, one way fingerprinted. Um, this the duplicate keys scan um, everywhere. If I 
scroll down and just keep going. It was kind of terrifying. You just, all the things. And they're all the same key. And I mean, SSH key is supposed to be, you know, unique per device, you know, per user. But this, like, hey, we've got a thousand of them that are exactly the same because we hard coded them because we put, couldn't be bothered doing it differently. So, you know, I decided to go, hey, let's find SSL private keys. By the way, the device in question here did SSL interception. Um, I used to have a great slide with the lovely NSA diagram of SSL added and removed here, but it got lost slash temp. But um, yeah, it, all these things, they intercept SSL, they fire stuff off over VPNs, and they've got private keys and public keys all over the shop, and they're all the same across devices. There's, that's a MD5 someone, the SSL keys, but you'll find these on things. They've got all these hard-coded certs and creds and stuff which are reused across the world, and are beautiful if you want to play with things. And if you want to intercept people's traffic, you just use those. And it basically renders all the what security provided by OpenVPN and OpenSSL absolutely useless. Um, as for SSL keys, they were various SSL private keys located across 108 firmware images. Um, there were six of them. They were all in each device, um, identical. And they weren't protected by any passphrase or credentials or anything, you just said straight up private key. So we found out these things are vulnerable as hell, right? Um, now, this is where I've got a bit of a gripe. So we're writing exploits for these things. So we found bugs. You know, we can go find bugs. Finding bugs is piss easy. Anyone could do it. You could probably get a three-year-old, and they'd find your remote route in half an hour. I mean, Vupin should hire an army of three-year-olds, and they'd have all the zero day in the world if they just targeted embedded devices. Because you look at them, and they break. I mean, if you want to find, if you've got a router at home, um, unplug it from the internet for a start before you do this, and make sure it's a spare one, because somebody, something somewhere is going to break horribly when you do this. But um, if you log into the, you spin up Burp, you log into your router through Burp, and this is a really lazy way of finding yet another zero day in these things, and then you just run Burp Scanner, you go pub, you come back, and you've probably got like 10 command injections. Lots of fun. You know, I mean, you can, an idiot could find these bugs. And these guys have no QA or anything, which is why these bugs end up in production. It's almost as if they're backdooring them for somebody, or somebody somewhere put people in or something, but then we go into conspiracy land. But you can get root in any of these things. They're rubbish, and nobody makes secure ones. Um, if you, if you go, oh, where can I get a secure router? Well, you can't. You're basically fucked, because none of these people could give a damn. Security doesn't get money. Shipping the latest thing with the fastest hardware does. Oh, we're going to bang the same shitty software on a sock. Here it goes. This sock is like a couple extra you know, kilohertz or whatever. Boom, ship it. ISPs buy in a million of them, ship them out to customers. And that ISP is basically a botnet in the fucking waiting. So, um, yeah. So people got command injection everywhere. I mean, this is like 90s wants its bugs back, guys. And this lives in your living room. You probably have four of them in your living room because you've probably got your router, your Plex or whatever the hell it is, you know, TV box. You've probably got some other embedded box somewhere like a Amazon talk to it and asks questions and you may have some other shiny thing because we all like shiny things. But you can get root in all the shiny things really easily. And like, okay, so when it comes to developing exploits in them though, it's really bloody hard. Most people just switch on Telnet and fuck off because they go, screw it, I can just tell that in now. Or, you know, they write a Metasploit module that gives a really horrible reverse command shell where if you hit control C, your shell dies, and stuff like that. Most people just switch on Telnet and disable IP tables. But we can have a lot more fun. We can develop better exploits. I mean, this is 2015. We don't need to do shit bad. We have the technology. We can, we can build reliable stuff. So we can do stuff like this. And this was my implementation of the CO1 tech remote route across every device I've ever manufactured, pretty much. And what I do is I use the command injection to upload a payload and then run the payload. And the payload's cross-compiled for the device. And by the way, I don't know the CV number for the bug because I don't think they ever bothered getting them because they're that useless. Um, and yeah. But you know, we just upload a backdoor and trigger it. And what I use is TSHD, tiny shell daemon, 
it is written by Christopher Vine, I'll discuss that one later, but if you upload a binary payload that you've written or that you like to use, any post-exploitation payload you would normally use for Linux, you can just bang it up there and run it. And you can do so much more than just a shell, like file transfer and stuff. And we can have reliable payloads, which work all the time, they beacon home. You know, we can do fun stuff. We can't just switch on Telnet and hope the box isn't behind that. Or that, you know, something somewhere is getting in the way. We can have a call back and stuff. Or, if you've got a box which is a bunch of scripting languages, um, you can do stuff like this. I'll be dropping the source code of this one later today. It's zero day in D-Link Nasus. Um, it's in the System Manager CGI script. What it does is because it's D-Link and because D-Link don't know what security is or input sanitization is, what they do is they've got a variable called command one and you put a command there, and you need no all. Now, when it comes to exploit development, this, uh, this one I had a lot of fun with, because if you've got a nice zero day for something, you don't want to fire it off at everything in the internet and pray, because some dickhead at some place is going to go, hang on, what's this coming across my network? And, you know, you're going to end up with IDS rules and signatures. So what you want to do is you want to fingerprint your target first, you want to make sure it's vulnerable, before you even trigger the bug, before you even give a hint as to what the bug is. So you use stuff like web server pairs, which are unique to that particular family of vulnerable embedded devices. They'll all have something weird in the headers, which you can search for and show them as well. So you go, right, this vulnerable box has this header. We'll look for that before we fire off with, you know, our exploit. And then you check if the vulnerable thing is there. You just send a head request and you go, are you there? Yes, yes you are. Alright, now we can proceed to actually testing if the vulnerability is there because we don't want to burn any zero days there. And then you fire off your exploit attempt and 100% of the time you're going to get a shell. <coughs> so what this one does is it exploits really trivial command injection and first does fingerprinting because I found out the hard way before that just because a vendor makes one box that's vulnerable has the same fingerprint as another because of vendors, the two of them might have entirely different socks, so you're going to end up with one arm and one MIPS, and you've no way of telling the difference until you go find out. Now with this one, um, I'll complain about this in the pub later actually, um, if anybody asks, I'll probably win for half an hour because it nearly ruined the demo. Uh, this box, the called XFB on it, if you write even a simple C program that calls XFB, XFB won't run, because the C library on it is absolutely fucked. Um, don't know why. Even if you statically link it, you write an assembly, it's not the assembly for, for ARM and run it. It's not going to work because it's screwed. So I used a PHP payload and I felt horrible because I actually write something in PHP for once. Um, but yeah, you can just send yourself a backnet. Um, yeah, there's a couple of details redacted like my callback post because people like sending my servers shut down requests um, and things. But you can write super reliable exploits for these things that'll work 100% of the time. You don't need Metasploit quality where it'll work half the time and it may be not. You can get 100% right reliability. You can be guaranteed before you fire off your exploit attempt that it's gonna work. So you know, we, we get shells. Like, it's always command injection. Like, you've got all your CSRF, you've got your XSS, you've got all your standard web app logs. We ignore those because quite frankly, they don't get us root straight away. We can bin them off, put them in a corner, responsibly disclose them like ethical white hats and stuff. And then you keep the remote route to ourselves for fun. Because you're going to find every device you assess, you're going to find yet another remote route because they're all rubbish and vendors don't care. And they're going to be rubbish for years because up until there's a market for a secure router, you're still going to be shit. Same with all embedded. But, you know, we, if we want to pop boxes, you know, if we want to pop these things, if you decide, Instead of going after your client's Windows XP estate, you instead own their router and have fun from there, whatever. Um, or, you know, your evil black hat and you go around rooting really routers for shits and giggles. I mean, we want to be able to do things. Now, I bash Rapid7 a lot, but they've got a really nice tool, you know, Meterpreter. I mean, Meterpreter is beautiful in Windows. And there's a POSIX Meterpreter somewhere in there, which doesn't work yet. Um, it's, it's actually available as a payload metasploit. And if they get that working on ARM, MIPS, PowerPC, all the weird architectures in the world, they will have the single greatest embedded hacking framework ever. 
what they haven't wanted yet because they're busy, you know, doing something in Ruby and probably arguing with Ruby dependencies. Um, like, you know, you type in Ruby and you've got like six Rubies, in fact, we do it all again. But um, yeah, if, if they get that sorted out, they're going to have the single greatest framework for owning embedded devices. But, you know, we, we want stuff like TSA where we can transfer files. If you get file transfer, you can expel data, you, know, you can upload your post exploitation tools, you can get a PTY shell where if you hit control C, it doesn't die. You can do nice things, and we really like nice things. Like, it, when you get a reverse shell from a box and you accidentally control C something and your shell dies, you get really ticked off. Whereas if you have PTY that's handled correctly, you can hit control C all day, you can SSH, you can run FC, you can do stuff. You can actually do useful things. And we want payloads that do that. So we can own the box, but can we do something useful with the box? And here's the thing, the bad guys are doing useful shit with boxes. They're owning our routers. I mean, your router is probably part of the botnet right now, right? These guys are doing stuff. Now, had my screenshots. I had beautiful things from various reverse engineering things, but I left them in slash temp because I'm an idiot. And I worked from slash temp. It's a hangover from the old days kind of thing. And well, box reboots, everything lost. Um, so I kind of explained the stuff. So um, this one is a fun one. Um, one of the other guys here today, and we stumbled across this, this beautiful piece of malware in the wild, which runs some embedded devices. It was targeting a couple of families of routers, and it was spreading by root force and creds. This was beautiful, though, because it reflashed the firmware of every device it infected. This was the first firmware level rootkit ever seen in the wild, like, for embedded shit ever. And we just accidentally ran across it. And this thing, all it did was it sat there. The guys had gone the firmware for it, they'd taken the firmware apart, they'd added a couple of bits, they'd added decent in a bunch of really shit shell scripts, and they'd repackaged the firmware, and then they just brute force routers across entire IP routers, they'd upload their new firmware, they'd flash it on the device, and then they'd do it. And what happened is, this thing is sit there, you'd have this, you know, router at a privileged network position, which all your traffic flows through, and it was sitting there picking up your passwords and FTPing them over to somebody else who's nobody put. There was no indicator of compromise, it was just silent. It wasn't sending any weird traffic, it beaconed out you know, every couple of days, it exfilled all your data. And it was just so beautifully put together. It was crude, but you know, effective. I mean, it was, it was horrible shell scripts. There was loads of bits commented out, and it was like, these guys can't write batch for shit. But it did the job. And they had like 6,000 boxes infected. And those 6,000, you know, edge of network things, probably like 10 clients behind them. So 6,000 by 10 is 60,000 random people's email accounts being busy FTP'd off to Lithuania. And it was, it was amazing because this was, I mean, it been hypothesized and stuff that some guy somewhere is gonna, you know, write a firmware rootkit. These guys went and did it. You know, these guys put their, you know, they just did it. Um, and then we've got lesser malware, or you know, the not as beautiful. We've got like Light Hydra, Hydra, every variant you know that every script kid in the world, lizard squad included, uses, um, where it's just a telnet and fucking SSH brute forcer, which goes across the entire IP ranges, uploads itself, calls back to IRC. Um, some of them use this dealing config bug, which gives you the root password. Um, and all them bots do is they just pack it. So they just infect devices and then they use DDoS. Like the, like allegedly the Lizard Squad net was basically a little shitty worm that infected routers, DDoS didn't do did one when they rebooted. They have no resistance. Um, these are common as muck. Um, Light Hydra was written by a really nice Italian guy. Um, he wrote it for fun and then he just gave it to the internet for free and now every script kitty in the world can have a router bot net because you just compile it, run it somewhere, and next thing you've got 10,000 infected devices calling off. So don't set your CNC to freedom. Or, you know, you need your IRC infrastructure and all that, but botnet operators know this for years. And you can probably send spam using them. Your fridge can probably send spam now, and your fridge probably has sent spam. But these things just do the OS to pack of kitty nets. And then we've got the moon. Now, this is one of the more interesting instances. Um, it specifically targeted Linksys. It was discovered by Johannes Ulrich, a SANS handler, um, and it used a zero day to spread. 
in sole spreading vector was this remote root command execution zero day against this router C. And just sent this, it was just in a get request. I wrote a proof of concept the second the, I, the second the worm was you know, announced. Um, it took about 10 minutes to reverse entry the worm and find the zero day used and then write a proof of concept. Because all I'll do is strings it. And there was the get request. But uh, this thing was beautiful because nobody has a single fucking clue what it, what it was intended for. All it did was spread. It had hard coded IP ranges that it scanned and infected every single box it found. And then it had loads of weird references to some film about space and stuff, and it like Jupiter lander ascending and shit. And you're just like, okay. And it seems to set up this kind of weird peer to peer infrastructure. And it seems to be some guy's test run. I mean, some guy did like, I've heard of this beautiful router malware framework, let's give it a crack. Oh, when I saw it, I was like, this is really well put together, but what the hell is it actually doing? And no one knows. And it just, it just infected all these devices. Scanned, infected, and then one day it just disappeared. It just switched off. The guy stopped seeding it anymore. And yeah, but people are doing this. It happens. Your router is probably owned. If your internet speed drops, you might want to look at, you know, is one of your boxes packeting something. So like, yeah, bad guys have got post exploitation figured out. You know, they're using it for their purpose, which is being script kiddies and packeting half the time, or you know, stealing your passwords and shit. But you know, we want to do post exploitation. We also want to do useful things, not packeting, but you know, stealing from people's passwords and creds and stuff. So um, embedded devices are a really nice target when it comes, to, you know, client networks and whatnot, because you've got some embedded device somewhere which is probably forwarding out to the internet and it lives either as a router, it lives in the most privileged position in your network where all your traffic goes through, or it lives somewhere in your network, like in your internal estate, or in your house, or in your living room. And it's, it's where you want to be as an attacker. You want to be on that device. But we need tools that put us on that device after we've got root on it, right? So, I mean, we can do stuff like we can sniff, we can spoof, we can inject stuff, we can pivot into networks. But we have to build the tools for our target first, because none of our usual shit's going to work. I mean, none of your, none of the usual pen testing framework payloads are going to work on these devices simply because they don't target them yet. Um, and then we've got the problem of how do we stay on the device? Because these things, again, real time operating systems, they're, when you reboot them, all the data is gone. Which, as an aside, by the way, is really epic. It's like, if somebody pops your router, the like standard computer friendly procedure of disconnect fucking everything isn't going to work, because the second you disconnect fucking everything, you've just lost all the evidence. It's binned on, because you've stored the flash, and there's no electricity going to the flash anymore, so it's gone. Physics has fucked your evidence. But you know, if we want to persist post reboot and stuff, and if we want to stay on your network without having to go repeatedly owning you, um, we need to sort that shit out, because if we get binned off your network every time you reboot your router, or every time your power fluctuates a little bit, we need to sort that one out. So, we need to build toolkits, and because these things are embedded Linux, and embedded Linux is bloody weird, and doesn't have a standard C library or anything in it, we need to statically compile them and link them, so they're static binaries, they've got all their dependencies built in, you know, they'll just run. We need to do them for the right architecture. Now, UCLibc.org has some beautiful tool chains for every architecture you can think of. Um, some I've never even heard of until I went there and W get it their entire binary distribution thing. Um, you can statically link damn near anything for damn near anything with them um, and do magic. Um, it's basically you just set your GCC to that path and compile and it works. And, but, you know, we can, we can cross-compile a lot of tools then, with some caveats that I'll mention along the way, but we now need to figure out what we actually need to do to do fun stuff, and surprisingly minimal toolkit. We don't need all the shiny in the world, we need some basic tools which do shit, and then we just extend them to do other stuff, and we just do stuff with them. I had some beautiful screenshots in the next section, by the way, which are lots to slack down. Um, and I had a couple of other things which I'll release in a couple of weeks, um, which were written for today, but have been, again, I should stop using slash times at work like three. <laughs> so, we've got requirements for post exploitation, right? I mean, you pop the box, you want to stay on the box. You pop somebody's router, you want to stay in their network. And 
you've got requirements. You want command and control. You want to be able to access the bloody thing in the first place. Um, you want to be able to talk to the thing. So you want to see and see. And you want to see and see that is robust, non-attributable. Um, you want to see and see that has good OPSEC. You want to see and see that doesn't care about firewalls. You want a solid C2. You want tools for getting shell and transferring files. You want tools for sniffing, spoofing, and doing useful shit on somebody's internal network. And you want to persist. When somebody switches off, you know, when your target switches off the router and switches back on, you want to be able to stay on it. You don't want to be binned off and reboot. You want to stay there. Or maybe you want to operate a memory. That depends on your use case. But we're going to assume you want persistence. You want persistent access. So for CNC, we should take a lesson from the Grook and not get arrested and such and use Tor. Um, and Tor also solves a lot of problems for us. It's like Tor is like a hammer and you've got a bunch of things that suddenly look like nails because they're used to solve every problem you have. With Tor, we get CNC built in. Instead of having a callback, we set it up in such a way we use Tor, cross compile it to the device, we stick it in the device, and we set it up as a hidden service. And we can just talk to that device directly. We don't need a command and control server. Every device has its own command and control built in. Because when we stick Tor in the device and we set it up as a hidden service to our back door, instead of the device calling back to us, we just talk to the device directly. We go, the hidden service is script target X is Y, I want to talk to target X. I don't want all them calling back to me, I talk to it. We use Tor as a method of embedding firewalls and to anonymize ourselves. Because if you're a bad guy or if you're doing offensive stuff, you don't, you know, you want to practice really good OPSEC. So you build your tools with OPSEC built in. And it avoids a whole bunch of problems. And we set up Tor as a hidden service point in our bind shell or access point to our back door. We don't have a CNC anymore. We just have owned boxes. And then access. So we've got our talk to the device, but what do we talk to on the device? I use TSHD. I highly rate TSHD as a tool for doing useful things because you've got fully encrypted command execution, file transfer, upload, download, and a full PTY where you've got like full pseudo terminals like you're sitting at the device, you're SSHed into it, you don't have a stupid netcat bind shell which dies when you send in a weird character. Um, I've got a build tool chain for cross compiling this for just about every architecture known to man um, that I'll be publishing in GitHub later. Um, Basically, you just run Meg and it'll build about 30 versions of it, or depending on how many of them actually work when I test them in an emulator, or probably about five that actually work, and a whole bunch that just second ball. But anyway, um, it's portable. It's written in beautiful C. You just run it on the device and it runs and it daemonizes itself and it sits there and it gives you access. And yeah, I advise using it in your pen test, by the way, because it runs on Linux, it runs on Mac, it runs on iPhones, it runs on Androids. I mean, when you run a box and you run TSHD on it, and you've just got the most beautiful, beautiful interface for doing stuff because you just have a shell, upload, download, execute commands, that's all you need. And it's there, and it just works. So then, I mean, we want to do stuff, right? So we just go, you know, we. We've got our way in, we've got our command and control, we want to do things. We want to do horrible things to people's networks, we want to break things, we want to ruin people's day. So we can cross compile the TCP dump and sniff all your traffic, we can stick header cap on it, and we can, you know, if we're not in a privileged network position, we can then man the middle of all your stuff. Um, shit, running out of time. But you know, we can, we can do all this, we can port scan, we can send things with SOCAP. I'll publish all the tool chains later on for cross compiling all these tools, but we can put tools there to do useful stuff. It's like you have a Linux box in a privileged position on somebody's network. You can do stuff. Um, and then persistence. Um, I'll quickly blow through this. Um, we need to know how firmware works. We can infect firmware. We can upload and flash new firmware. Um, unless you reflash your firmware every couple of weeks, you're permanently owned. Unless you go and modify it. You're done for. Um, this router post exploitation firmware from Michael Coppola, it's beautiful. It automatically infects a whole bunch of firmware. You can write definitions for your own targets, um, and you can create malicious firmware that way. They're, once they're in, they're not going away. 
Once it's done, it's game over. So um, they exist. I explained an example a bit earlier. Um, if you don't believe they exist, you're you know you're probably in the wrong industry um, because they're there. You're not getting rid of them. Bad guys are using them. Um, yeah. Too long to read. If it's embedded, it's already owned. You should harass your vendors. You should be very abusive towards them until they sort their shit out. Um, they're embedded root shells and. Fun day for everyone to be had if you play with it. Yeah. Thanks to everyone for listening to me rant about shite for an hour. Um, Digital organizing, a couple of other people for getting me to talk about weird stuff and vendors. I love vendors. <laughs> yeah. uh, contact details and stuff if you wanna. Yeah. There we go.